Greetings from Yale. I'm going to first talk about uh, some research from my neuroscience laboratory, uh, and then I'll talk about why I think Yale is such a terrific place to be a STEM student pursuing a liberal education. Uh, first, uh, to describe my research program, I'm using this slide over here, a scene from a science fiction movie where I get a lot of motivation and ideas for my research program. This is a scene from Total Recall, where you can see that a bad guy is trying to read out uh, secrets uh, from the hero's uh, mind uh, placed inside the brain scanner. Um, and, and this is literally what I try to do in my research laboratory as well. We use brain scanners uh, and try to decode uh, people's uh, thoughts uh, and emotions uh, and characteristics, individual characteristics. Uh, and we do so not to be creepy, um, but because uh, our ability to do so helps us understand the mind and the brain better uh, and will lead to many practical and useful clinical applications. Um, very fortunate to be at Yale, which is a research university that is most committed uh, to teaching and learning. Uh, this is our mission, uh, stated by President Salovey, uh, and it really guides, uh, I think, and really summarizes well what makes it such a great place uh, to be a STEM student. Uh, as one sign of how uh, we are a research institution committed to teaching and learning, uh, this is an image of a brain scanner. Uh, exactly the kind of scanners that I use for my research. Uh, this is located on campus, uh, very close to the classrooms, uh, very close to where students live in the residential colleges. Uh, and uh, and uh, what, what we have here is actually President Salovey himself uh, testing out uh, the brain scanner when we opened up the center about two years ago. Um, just to make sure that it was operational uh, and to make sure that it wasn't dangerous to uh, our participants going inside it. As one of our first participants, we asked President Salovey uh, to test it out for us. Uh, and we did so in a fun way as part of an opening ceremony for the Brain Imaging Center. Uh, and, and any uh, opening ceremony, uh, you know that there's typically a ribbon and you cut your ribbon with a real scissors. Uh, what we did here, I think, is really novel and innovative, uh, and I think maybe a first for a university president. Uh, we asked President Salovey to cut the ribbon um, uh, of this brain imaging center using his mind alone. Uh, and we would read out his mind uh, by uh, having him be in this brain scanner and asking him to concentrate on uh, moving that scissors. Uh, that would be a virtual one on a computer screen. Uh, and that's shown over here. The, on the left here, you see images of President Salovey's brain uh, and uh, while he's being scanned. Uh, and then as he's concentrating on moving the scissors, uh, we can see that he was very successful in doing so and ultimately was able to cut uh, the virtual ribbon, uh, hence uh, opening up the Brain Imaging Center. Uh, and uh, we declared this uh, publicly uh, uh, as, um, uh, as a proud announcement. Of, of this new imaging center. That is, again, a research facility, a very cutting edge research facility uh, that is available for uh, student use so that they can learn uh, how the brain works and how to use the methods uh, to study the brain. Uh, as one, another example of uh, the kind of research that I do in my laboratory, uh, together with many colleagues around the university, uh, including Todd Constable uh, at the um, School of Medicine, uh, where I also have an appointment. Um, this is a, a scene from Harry Potter. Again, a different kind of motivation for the work I'm about to describe to you. Um, uh, I'm sure you know this scene uh, from Harry Potter where uh, students get designated uh, to the different uh, houses uh, in the movie uh, based on the sorting hat, uh, which can read out uh, like who this person is and what this person is like. Um, you can kind of do the same thing with brain uh, scanners as well. Uh, that is the motivation for the work I'm about to describe to you. So imagine taking a person now and putting them in that brain scanner uh, that I just showed you a moment ago. And we can scan people's brains, let's say, for about 10 minutes. Because uh, uh, even while the subject is not being asked to do anything, uh, the brain is always spontaneously active. Uh, and in doing so, we can do some remarkable things such as reading out a person's IQ and intelligence uh, from that brain scan alone. Uh, and we can do that uh, because everyone's brain is unique 
And we've developed algorithms for figuring out what makes each person's brain unique uh, and, uh, and then correlating that, those unique um, brain features uh, with uh, behaviors such as someone's intelligence uh, is, is one example. Um, uh, another example is we can read out how, um, how attentive you are. Uh, we can read out whether someone has severe ADHD symptoms or not. Uh, and there's just many other kinds of characteristics that we can read out from these brain scans uh, because of the fact that everyone's brain is unique like a fingerprint. Uh, and uh, the, the clinical applications of this are, are, quite, uh, are, are quite extensive. Uh, imagine being able to put a number on uh, uh, how depressed a person is or how anxious a person is or how likely someone will develop uh, dementia um, or, uh, or autism uh, and, and, and many other kinds of um, uh, dis dysfunctions that, that will be important to measure quantitatively uh, and to address as early on uh, as possible. Uh, these are some of the clinical applications that uh, make me excited about this kind of brain uh, scanning research. Uh, another uh, study I'd like to share with you um, is, uh, was actually led by an undergraduate student, Alan Cohen, uh, and um, uh, he, he had this really uh, creative idea of scanning people while they're looking at people's faces uh, in the scanner one by one. Uh, and of course, if you're looking at a face in the scanner, your brain will respond to those faces. Uh, and then he, what, he, what he proposed next was quite innovative. He said, uh, let's try to use artificial intelligence, machine learning methods, to look at the patterns of brain activity uh, that are triggered by whatever face a person is doing, and let's try to re reverse engineer, let's try to guess from those brain patterns what faces people were looking at at that particular moment. Uh, and that's what I'm gonna show here on the bottom of the screen are the computer-generated guesses as to what face a person was looking at um, relative to the one right above it. So again, the way this works is when people are looking at this face, uh, the computer guessed based on brain activity alone, that this, it literally drew the face uh, that uh, it thinks uh, the person was looking at in the scanner. And you can see these for all these different pairs uh, of the faces. Uh, it was a remarkable uh, study. Uh, and again, uh, this was, um, this was uh, made possible, it was an idea from an undergraduate student. It was made possible because even though brain imaging research is very expensive, uh, Yale is committed to providing these research opportunities for our students. Uh, and then on top of that, imagine being able to not only do the study, uh, but publishing it in a journal, which is what uh, Alan did uh, together with uh, a, a supervisor in my lab, Bryce Cool, uh, who was a postdoc at the time. And uh, imagine being able to publish it, that's shown here on the bottom left. And not only that, imagine getting media attention uh, for, for your research. Uh, and, and this was very humbling for me as a faculty member, um, you know, uh, although I'm very fortunate to be uh, a faculty member here at Yale, uh, nothing I've done really got the popular media interested in my work. Um, but this undergraduate study uh, received widespread attention, including an article in the Wall Street Journal, uh, CNN, um, USA Today, uh, NPR, uh, Wired, um, all these outlets. Uh, were, uh, were uh, featured uh, by, uh, this uh, student's work, Alan's work. Uh, and so I was very proud to be a part of that. Um, this is just an example of uh, some publications uh, from, uh, from undergraduate students who've done research and have published from my laboratory, uh, typically about one uh, every uh, two years, uh, one every year uh, we'll publish uh, from the lab. Um, and then and, and they go off and do really great things. I'll just give you some examples uh, just so you get a feel for uh, what students can do uh, after Yale. Um, so um, uh, Polito uh, went to Columbia Med School. Uh, Lissa went to, win, uh, went to um, UPenn Medical School. Harrison uh, went to um, uh, Yale Law School, um, MIT PhD program. Uh, Sam went to um, Stanford Medical School. Um, uh, she went to um, a Stanford uh, PhD program. Uh, he went to, uh, Alan went to uh, Google and, 
and uh, Srijan went to uh, Princeton uh, PhD program. Uh, these are all amazing places uh, that uh, these uh, students, and they're really great for graduate school and professional school. And so I'm, I'm just really excited to have had these students here at Yale College uh, go off uh, to these really uh, excellent um, places uh, beyond Yale. Um, the, uh, the, the, what, the final thing I'll share about my research is that, um, is that uh, it really relies very heavily uh, not just on neuroscience but on computer science and machine learning methods. Um, uh, as, as, you, as many of you know, uh, we're going through a revolution uh, in, in, in artificial intelligence where uh, it's gaining capabilities that we thought would only be possible 10 to 20 years from now, uh, such as beating a human uh, champion in the very complex game of Go. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, the person who led the development of the AI program that, uh, that uh, became a Go uh, champion uh, is a person named Demis Hassabis. He's the CEO of Google DeepMind, one of the most prominent and innovative artificial intelligence companies uh, in the world. Um, and uh, what I'd love to share about him uh, is that his background was a neuroscientist. Uh, and if you ask him what allowed him to create such innovation for his AI algorithms, uh, he literally talks about how his artificial intelligence is inspired uh, by neuroscience. Uh, and a direct quote uh, is that with so much at stake, uh, the need for the field of neuroscience and AI to come together is now more urgent than ever before. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I think uh, uh, this, this is a very important theme for uh, research in neuroscience moving forward. Now, so I'll switch gears now to talk about why I think Yale is such a terrific place uh, to uh, pursue uh, your uh, ambitions in STEM. Um, uh, of course, we are a research powerhouse because we are a research institution with many schools around, beyond, around Yale College, uh, including the School of uh, Medicine, a School of Public Health, School of Nursing, uh, just countless other professional schools uh, are all available as part of our ecosystem, all available uh, to provide research opportunities for our students. Uh, in fact, over 95% of our students, undergraduate students, uh, participate in research uh, during their time at Yale. Uh, and, and we're a very diverse, inclusive place where 47% of our STEM students are women. Um, and, uh, and we really have amazing uh, fa student to faculty ratios. Um, with these two to one ratios uh, uh, where students uh, can work directly with faculty members, with postdoctoral fellows, with research scientists uh, to uh, get a direct mentoring for their, for their research uh, activities. Um, and, uh, and, but also it's not just about all the STEM opportunities that are available at Yale, uh, which are world class. Um, but what I really think is uh, what makes Yale a special place is that you can be, you can do top notch STEM research uh, and, uh, and take classes uh, in STEM while also being a broad uh, student with excellence all over um, the liberal arts uh, curriculum and also uh, in terms of extracurricular activities. So not only would you be able to take you know, the best neuroscience classes, chemistry classes, you know, do research uh, in, uh, in a bio biology lab, uh, but you can also take classes uh, on, uh, in the social sciences, such as this, uh, one of the world's most famous courses, largest course in Yale history, uh, a course on, called The Psychology and the Good Life, uh, taught by a celebrity professor, uh, Laurie Santos. Um, who, who is literally, um, you know, one of the leading um, uh, psychologists uh, in the country uh, and in the world, um, showing uh, uh, who, who really does research uh, and shares the research on how uh, people uh, can be happier uh, and have more uh, productive uh, uh, lives. Um, another example is, you know, you could take classes from, uh, from Nobel laureates in other fields, in this case, uh, economic sciences. Uh, this is uh, Bill Nordhaus, who received the Nobel Prize uh, in, in economics uh, for his work uh, for integrating climate change into long-run um, macroeconomic analysis. 
um, you know, this is, this is really cool because he's literally um, not, not just an economist, but he's taking real world problems and questions uh, and approaching it from a multidisciplinary standpoint to receive, uh, to have impact and to receive the recognition uh, that, he, that he gained with this Nobel Prize. Um, and, and, you know, and this is a really fun story because on the day where he received his, uh, where he got word of his Nobel Prize, you would imagine that you would cancel everything and, uh, you know, and do your press conferences and all that. Um, but in his case, he had a class uh, scheduled that day and he committed to doing his class first uh, before doing his press conference. And so uh, there's actually a beautiful photo of uh, the students, uh, of his doing his class and students um, congratulating him directly even before he did his uh, uh, international uh, press conference uh, for, for receiving the Nobel Prize. Uh, and these are the kinds of faculty from whom you would be taking classes, uh, not just in STEM, but also uh, outside of STEM. Uh, and uh, you know, for, uh, you, you know, there may be there may be many students who um, have uh, who are pre have interest in going to medical school or other uh, health professions. Uh, and I just wanted to note uh, that um, you know a lot of the medical schools and health professions believe that uh, training good doctors starts with the liberal arts, uh, knowing how to write, knowing how to read closely, um, getting exposure to ideas across the humanities uh, and the social sciences and the arts. Uh, and uh, Yale is just a really uh, terrific place uh, to do that. And so you can, be a, you can be an even an English major here at Yale, take all your pre-med courses uh, while you're doing your English major and, uh, and then uh, pursue medical school um, or other uh, related professions uh, after, after graduating. And so in general, you know, from, you know, we're just a really fabulous learning community uh, where students support each other, where we're very diverse, uh, and we learn so much from uh, other students, both uh, inside the laboratories, uh, but also in the residential colleges, even over lunches and dinners, uh, in our beautiful uh, dining facilities, uh, eating delicious food. Uh, and you're going to make some of your best friends uh, in the residential colleges and on campus. Uh, your friends will be either in STEM or outside of STEM, uh, which, I, which I think makes, uh, enriches your lives uh, in college. Uh, and we also just know how to have a lot of fun uh, here at Yale. This is just an example of a, a big party called Bulldog Bash uh, that we, uh, that we uh, run annually. Uh, and so, I, you know, thank you for your uh, time uh, listening to uh, my uh, video. And... Um, and I hope I, I hope it gets you interested in uh, thinking about coming to Yale, where where we will uh, hopefully give you an electrifying uh, experience. Uh, thank you so much.